What's up? I'm Gannon Burr. I'm sponsored by Prodigious, Wander Disc Golf, and Titan Disc Golf. And you're listening to the Chain Clankers Podcast. You're listening to the Chain Clankers Podcast with your hosts, Quinn Ferris and Horatio Gonzalez. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chain Clankers. What's going on, everyone? Horatio here with Chain Clankers Podcast, and with me, like always, Quentin. Today, we had a super exciting interview with Gannon Burr. I'm sure if you guys watch uh, tournaments on Disc Golf Network or Joe Mass, you saw him at the Waco tournament with a really solid performance, and he's only 15. Uh, very excited to hear what you guys have to say. Um, hope you guys are enjoying spring. You know, we finally got nice weather. As soon as we get out of here, I'm going to go play myself. But with that said, Quentin, what can you tell us about today's episode? Yeah, man, today's episode is going to be a banger for sure. This guy, Gannon, is going to be one hell of a disc golfer, man. He, yep. You just listen to the episode, man, and, and you can really understand that this guy is going to be great in the sport, and we are going to be seeing his name for at least the next 15 years. Um, yeah, super excited to talk about it. We really get into his story. I mean, the guy's, like like Chris said, the guy's 15 years old, guys, and, and was on lead card in, in Waco. Um, th- this guy really dives into his story. We talk about his world championship, so that's really fun. And, you know, we talk about the Waco experience and some things that had happened to him and what he was able to learn from. You know, in the last episode, we talked a little bit about Horatio almost became a BMX star. This episode, we almost discover how uh, Gannon was not a skateboarding star. So you're going to want to make sure you stay tuned for, for that. <laughs> and that was kind of funny. Um, but yeah, really good. Then we really get into the main subject, man. We're talking about wind, we're talking about ankle control. Those things are super important, especially if you're playing in the Midwest like we are. You have to be on your angles and you have to understand what the wind is going to do to your discs. So we have a fantastic discussion about that. This ace round is great as always. There's tons of good tips. If you haven't already, leave a like rating on this. If you're watching on YouTube, and if you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere else, if you could leave us a rating and review, we would highly appreciate that. But without further ado, let's go ahead, let's hit the course, and let's bring Gannon on. Let's welcome onto the podcast another young stud, somebody who is quickly rising through the ranks of disc golf on Team Prodigy. Gannon, how are we doing today, man? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Super stoked to have you. A lot of you guys probably know Gannon's name from his performance in Waco, seeing him on lead card and Jomez. We're going to talk about all that today. And we've got some other fun conversational pieces. Um, where can the people follow you at on Instagram right now, Gannon? Uh, my Instagram is Gannon underscore Burr underscore DG. And my Facebook is just Gannon Burr. And then uh, hopefully soon I'll have a YouTube channel. Nice. Cool. Super excited for that. Uh, definitely, we will be one of the first people to subscribe to that YouTube channel as soon as it drops. Okay. So let us know, and we'll make sure we also share it out as well. So let's kind of get started with your disc golf journey, right? So uh, remind everyone, if they might have missed it, how old are you? Uh, 15. 15. Wow, that's crazy. I mean, yeah, I'm looking here at your PDA, PDGA page. And 15 years old, you've been a member since 2015. So you've been a member for five years. So just take us back, you know, to when you started your story. Tell us your whole story as, you know, as well as you remember it. Mm -hmm. So basically, I was just watching Brody Smith videos on YouTube. Um, I just always was amazed by a flying object propelled by your own body. And like with a Frisbee, that's just like so cool because you can like throw it so effortlessly and it goes so far. Um, so I just like I had a basketball hoop in my backyard because we had a massive park. We had just moved to a big city um, and I was watching his YouTube videos and I went to my local sporting goods store to go buy an ultimate Frisbee. So I could do those same trick shots just for fun. Um, and I accidentally bought an end of a champion Firebird by accident. And I just stuck with it from there and uh, got watched uh, Will Shoestrick. Um, that's kind of who I model my game after. And I'll, like you can probably uh, notice that by just watching me or even like what the announcers say and that's that's how I got into disc golf and then I got like a mini like three disc the Innova starter pack for Christmas and me and my dad went out at like it was like 15 degrees outside because we live in Iowa it's really cold in the winter and we just went to our local course and started playing for fun and then uh, the more I watched YouTube videos the more I got into it the more interested I was so I 
I just kept going out there and both my houses, my mom and my dad's house had a huge field. So that was really helpful in stunting my growth. Nice. That's how, awesome. old were, how old were you when you, you know, went and got that uh, Firebird? Um, I think it, so I started playing, my first term was June in 2015. And I think it was the winter before. So it wasn't, it was you know, like six months before. So I was probably nine and a half maybe or 10 and a half one of those and kind of like you're talking about like you know watching the Brody smith videos which is funny that's how i also first kind of got into just like frisbees and disc golf in general was watching Brody smith's tutorials on how to just throw a frisbee in the first place that's, so that, how, that's, that's what i did neat. too yeah yeah um Wow, those videos back then, they were something else, man. YouTube was a different time way back then. But uh, so like, you know, you're still a very young guy, obviously, and, you know, not even 10 years old yet starting to slang. So what I imagine just a whole lot of it was just going out and having fun with the fam, right? Or, you know, was it immediately like, hey, I'm really good at this. I'm going to do a bunch of field work and I'm going to take this super seriously. Kind of what, what was that mentality like for you when you got started? I was just like always like in love with just getting more discs. And every time I got a disc, I was so excited. So I just actually just would go out to my field for like, from like 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. the entire day and just throw the entire time. I'd come in for like a 15 minute break, but I just go straight back out there and just have fun. It wasn't, it wasn't practice at all. It was just like having fun. And of course I wanted to get better because I knew once I got better, it'd be even more fun. Yeah. Um, but I didn't realize I was like good until I played in my first junior world championship in 2016. I had, I was down by like 12 after two rounds and I brought it back to like two strokes or no, I was tied for the lead after four rounds. So I, I like, and then just, I was like perplexed by a lot of these juniors like Harper Thompson. I always looked up to him. He's on team prodigy too, but um, I'd seen his videos and I was like, I was just in love with his game. And then a lot of other kids, my, my age back then too, I just, uh, was like, wow, they're so good. I'll never be as good as them. And I actually go to junior worlds and beat them. And then that was kind of when I realized like, Hey, I can actually maybe go somewhere in this sport. How, how many tournaments did you do up to that champions? Um, it was, two or three, maybe four. Oh, wow. How'd you do in those tournaments? Uh, my first tournament, I didn't even know like funny money or like cashing was a thing. I just showed up and played. I played in a rec. My first round was like 720 rated. And then I came back to like an 850, but I think I missed cash by like one stroke, but I didn't even know what that was. So the second I was done with my round, I actually just left and like, <laughs> so I didn't even know what to do. And then my next sec, my second rec tournament I actually won. Um, well, my dad, we tied after the first round in rec. So that was kind of funny because uh, I destroy him now. But um, And then everyone was like, move up, move up. So the next year on that same tournament, I played intermediate. But uh, I, I played decent up and up until Worlds. But I, I, had no, I had nothing I'd compare myself to because I was only playing against adults. What was it that made you want to start playing tournaments? Uh, I'm super competitive. Um, I hate losing with a passion, uh, and like getting beat just like fueled my fire so much, even just as a little kid. Um, I've just always been so competitive. I've n I never want to lose. I always want to be on top. Um, it was obviously that, but just having fun too, just, I naturally got better. Um, and right from like the get go, I knew it was really important to like, um, have like good form. Like ever since I was like, like 11 when I was st first starting to pop up in my local area, everyone was like, yeah, his form's amazing, blah, 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 which I really attribute to how good I am right now. It's, it's all form uh, for me because you can be really good at disc golf, but if you can't transfer that onto the course, you're not going to be a good, you're not going to actually place well. So like with me at Waco, I was just hitting my lines and I was really consistent. So I think form is the biggest reason why I was so good, so young to start out with. Yeah. Have you, let's talk a little bit about, you know, your, I guess your body type, you know, you're pretty, you're pretty tall, I guess, for your age. And mm -hmm. then really, you know, long arms, which I feel like for disc golf, that's like huge. Like it's very helpful. 
Um, we always talk about that rubber band, you know, making your arm into a rubber band. The longer yeah. your arms are, the better. Um, were you, when you were 11, were you pretty, you know, kind of similar body style for your age? Yeah, I've always been like really, really skinny. Um, like I'm not like super skinny, like where I have like no muscle. Like I've always like been able to like do lots of like fitness and stuff pretty well. Um, but I've, I, I was actually kind of short I, I was always tall for my age but I wasn't like super tall um I, I mean I grew four inches in the last year and a half so I'm like I'm six two and a half right now but I, I've always had the same body type like super super lanky and just like skinny yeah. we're like which is kind of weird like because um uh, my dad and my mom are kind of like short and stubby <laughs> so I, I I look nothing like them so I, I have a bunch of like old jeans because all my like great great grandparents and stuff like we're like six seven right so i think i got like a way back gene i like that's why i'm tall because i'm the tallest one in my family right now damn those recessive genes coming out to play yeah let's awesome. go baby <laughs> dropping them strokes man that's awesome that's that's really cool who would have thought that the chain clankers disc golf podcast would have also turned into the chain clankers science podcast yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> hey man, I'll have a discussion about recessive genes. I just watched some video on it the other day. So uh, no, that, that's we really just got cool done though. learning about that in biology this year, actually. So I kind of understand it now. Nice, nice. nice. Yeah. Um. So you mentioned it a little bit earlier. 2016, going to the World Championships. But I would like to discuss the two World Championships you have, and you took home and won. I, someone correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm pretty sure you're the first guy that we've interviewed that is a world champion on the podcast. You got one in 2017 and 2019. Could you maybe take me through a little bit, just what that experience was like? Yeah, actually. So, um, I have a good friend, Isaiah Esquivel, who we've always been. So we're the same age. We've always been so close skilled wise and how we compete. Um, and, uh, he wasn't there in 2016, but going into 2017, I knew I had a good chance to win. Um, but I knew he was going to be my number one competitor. Um, so I was actually, like, super nervous. I know, like, I was just hoping to get, like, top four or make the final nine even. Um, and after round one, it, like, I think I had, like, a four-stroke lead. And then after day two, which we had played three rounds through then, I think I had a 15-stroke lead. And that wow. eventually went to a 30-stroke lead. And then – I think I won by 31 or 30 strokes in the final nine eventually. And then my 2019, this almost the same exact thing happened. Uh, I had like, I, I was even way more nervous for 2019 because we had a bunch more good competitors coming. Uh, a few of them, Ty Love, he's a good friend of mine. He lives in Oregon. He'll be doing some tour events this year. He, he shot um, a 12 down, I think, at Las Vegas this year. Um, I know Disc Golf Pro Tour posted about him. But we had a bunch of good competition, um, and the same thing happened. I was, like, I was nervous after round one. I was only, like, a three-stroke lead, I think. And then through about four rounds, I'd brought it to about seven. And then after round six, I had a 27-stroke lead, and then I won by 27 strokes. So I kind of, like, pulled away. I shot, I think, a 10-30 or something like that. Um, so pretty much the same thing happened. I was really nervous to start, and then – once I got my flow going, I just was kind of unstoppable. Um, and I just carried that through every round pretty much. That's, that's awesome. I'm going to ask you a little bit about that here in a second. But just real quick, I mean, what? So you won 1917. Tell us a little bit about what happened in 18 or why. So you ended up getting a fourth place there. Was your game just not in tune as it usually was? Or what happened there? Okay, so I um, – it was like June. It was like about a month before the event. I was skateboarding. almost broke both my wrists. Um, I was at well, was petting boarding. So I was just like riding around for fun. Um, we were like in between houses. So we were actually living in an apartment at a time. And I was like riding on like the parking lot. And there was a huge crack in the road. And my front wheel got stuck in that crack. And I was going like 15 miles an hour. And I went straight forward, put both my hands out. Uh, almost broke both my wrists right here. I stretch some ligaments and sprain some tendons um so i actually couldn't play for an entire month up until that event and i had also like it was just extremely painful and i probably should have done it at the time but i wasn't working on anything like i definitely could have been working on my footwork 
because when I came back, um, Worlds is actually like my first event back because we took a week long vacation the day before Worlds. So I usually get there a day before the event starts. And we were in Virginia and I woke up at like three in the morning, rode a plane there. And then I was in Emporia, Kansas at like five o'clock that night. But I had zero practice for an entire month. I felt like I lost all my muscle memory. Uh, wrists were in pain. And my footwork was the biggest thing because that set off my entire game. Um, and I shot like two of the worst rounds to start. And then I kind of came back with a 990, like a 1020 um, to actually bring me back within the final nine, which I had a chance to get third. But I was happy with having no practice um, yeah. and pain. And my footwork feeling like garbage. So, yeah, that's pretty crazy. All of that, I knew there was, there had to be something there, you know, and that's pretty insane. And then to still be able to finish in fourth, that shows just, you know, the caliber of the player that you are, and then you're going to, mm -hmm. you're going to be going into the future. Um, just real quick on junior. So, at what point are you either not allowed to play in that world championship or do you choose not to? Because, I mean, you're winning by 30, 27 strokes so at what point do you know you're like there's not really a point for me to play in those anymore i'm just gonna play with the big boys or how does that work are you talking about for 2020 yeah or just like you know like juniors or for anyone else that's you know younger do you mm -hmm. have to play in juniors if you're a certain age or can you go up to you know just regular yeah it's kind of like mp40 you can choose to play like open or whatever any division uh, but what's a little bit different is, yes, it's age protected, but if you take cash, you actually can't play juniors. Um, mm -hmm. My issue actually was, is I was skateboarding again. Didn't obviously learn from the first time, but now I have. Uh, I was turning around a corner going about 20 miles an hour, like 200 feet by my house. I was almost home after like a four mile ride. It was actually an electric one. So I could like control the speed and the brake and whatever. Um, and I ran off the board because the turn was too sharp and I was going too fast to like hop off. And the second my left foot planted, my knee popped and I couldn't walk after two minutes. And every time I even moved my leg, it felt like someone was stabbing a knife right into my knee. And it had swelled up to the size of like a grapefruit in seconds, pretty much. And it wasn't like, ouch, I hurt myself. It's like, I'm not going to be the same. Um, so he went to, uh, orthopedic surgeon. He said I tore my ACL mm. after a bunch of tests. So this was in late May. Uh, and then we actually got, he says they, there, there's a chance it could be a false reading. Um, but he hasn't seen one in 15 years. And, uh, I just thank God because we got a, um, MRI and I was a false reading. I actually didn't tear my ACL. Wow. Um, my bone, so your ACL connects between your two leg bones, like right in the middle. Um, it pulled a piece off my bottom bone, my tibia, and that can create a false reading because it's the same thing. When they do your test, they grab your leg and pull your tibia forward because that's what your ACL prevents is from translation forward on your uh, femur, which is your top bone. And that's why it swelled up so much. And it's also why I didn't have bruising down my leg with an ACL tear. Lots of times you have bruising down your entire leg and it doesn't swell up as fast and you can actually like still walk and the pain's gone pretty quickly. Like you can walk after an ACL tear with mine. I couldn't walk. I, I'd broken my leg and I actually did walk it off for the first like minute. And <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And then nope. So now I had surgery and it's about a five month quicker recovery time. And because bone, all he went, all I had to do was put the bone back where it broken off. Um, there was a, I actually didn't need surgery, uh, but there was possible complications with that because it's just floating around in space in my knee, my bone. Um, so it could have healed wrong and that would have had like a bunch of complications. So we just went to surgery, which is a smarter decision, honestly. Uh, that way I'm back to hundred percent eventually. And basically just did physical therapy and then by October I played my first tournament I had no sidearm I could barely walk and my run-up was like slower than a turtle <laughs> that's kind of a long story <laughs> and that was you said you got back this past October right yeah this past October so I was out for four months completely um okay. and then my first like actual round back was Waco so it's been like nine months since like I had a real round 
and my sidearm is still because it's my plant leg it doesn't want to be twisted on um there's no pain i haven't had pain for seven months you know the pain was gone almost immediately after like i started physical therapy um it was just like my brain doesn't want to plant and i have to slowly teach it that back um so I just, I just don't consider any of my 2020 tournaments like legit because I wasn't even close to recovered or like fully recovered back to my normal game. Yeah, that, I mean, that's crazy. The fact that really the first action you're back in is Waco and then we see you perform very, very well. I think we're ready to transition and let's talk a little bit about Waco and let's just start with, you know, coming out there hot first round. What were you feeling after that round? And then, you know, feeling, you know, wow, I'm really about to be on lead card Joe Mez. Like what was running through your mind? Man, I was just like, well, it was kind of weird because my round didn't feel that good. I know it sounds dumb, but like even my mom was like, yeah, I wasn't surprised at all with how, how you played. Like, because, I when I get into a rhythm, I kind of just keep going birdie, 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 birdie. Um, so I was just in a good rhythm, and my, my me and my mom weren't surprised on my play, but more of where I was placed at. So I I had no idea because they switched the pars up a little bit even from last year, because um, they switched like two of the par fours up or something like that. Um, and we um, hold up, I'm brain farting right now. <laughs> Basically, yeah, we just weren't surprised with my play at all. Um, I, I had no idea what was a good score out there. So my nine down, I wasn't, like, pressured to shoot good, I guess. Yeah. Um, so that, that kind of, like, led to me shooting well. And then uh, that was just, like, this is kind of bad, but I was, like, I know Chris Dickerson was the only person who could take me off that lead card. Um, <laughs> I was just praying for him to mess up on 17 or 18. <laughs> And he did, luckily for me, so I was on lead card. It wasn't anything against him. It was just I wanted yeah. to be on lead card. Yeah. What was the difference, you know, in your game or in your mind, you know, the first round, not having any pressure, you know, not knowing what you needed to score, just playing your game. And then second round, you know, being on lead card with some of these big name guys, What was there a lot of added pressure there? None. Like, I just was hoping that we'd continue to talk because mm-hmm. – I play best when I'm like relaxed, like it's a practice round. And yeah. I actually played with Gavin first round. Um, and we both talked the entire round, our whole card did. They were like all super nice. I played with Cam and then Aiden uh, Guthrie. And um, yeah, we talked the entire round. Second round, there was no talking. That was the thing that set me off. Um, it was just so like quiet and I hated it. Yeah. Uh, but I just learned that's what happens on lead card. Um, but it didn't, it didn't affect my play. I just, like, I definitely didn't get any good breaks that day. Day two, I had no good breaks. Like, my – I don't know if – for anyone who saw my whole nine, uh, I double bogeyed that, and all my shots were, like, an inch off being perfect. Yeah. So, I know my drive was about a foot too far right. That's why I hit that tree. But it was really my second shot that got me because I had nicked that middle tree by about three inches. And if I was, you know, three inches to the right, I would have had an easy par. So – it's just kind of stuff like that kind of happened throughout the day. Hole 11 is uh, the one, the one hole at Paul and Beth missed when he shot 18 down here that like straight par three. I hit that dead center middle tree after throwing a perfect drive. And that leaves me 70 feet away, which I'm never running that putt. Uh, just kind of more stuff like that. Bad break on 12. Um, that was kind of a reason I didn't shoot as great. And also I didn't get the birdies to start out. I was even par through nine. Uh, day two and I was six down through nine day one yeah you can see the big difference right there um that, that's crazy man I mean like I've always said to Horatio I know we've said this a lot you know the disc golf disc golf course giveth and the disc golf course taketh man and Take just being a couple of inches <laughs> off is the difference between being six down and even which is just crazy to think about um what was it like? I mean, I, I know you talked a little bit about your card mates and how there just wasn't that much talking going on, really. So I, I feel like you're somebody who maybe kind of thrives off the uh, having a good time talking with everyone on there. You know, I know you played with some really good players. You know, Nico has been around for ever it feels like so like maybe could you just go a little bit deeper into what it was like playing with those guys on your card? 
I mean, yeah, it was still a ton of fun. They're all really nice guys. And, you know, we all kept our composure. Um, uh, I mean, it was definitely still a fun time, even just being at, like, a course that fun, you know. Um, but definitely, like, just no talking. It was really quiet. We definitely said good shot to each other, like, anytime someone threw a good shot. But we weren't constantly having a conversation. So that was the only different part, I guess. Did, did you feel, you know, because I know sometimes when I've played – um, with players that are a lot better than me, there's almost like a a motivation to make a better shot or sometimes I end up playing better because I'm around people that, you know, are keeping me up to a higher standard. Was there any of that playing with those guys? No, like that doesn't really affect me. Um, I actually like to think I play better, like with people who aren't as good as me because what happens is if I get in a rhythm and I see them going like bogey, 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 I'm like, Oh, let's go. I'm just getting more strokes. Um, <laughs> that kind of like relaxes me even. Um, but uh, I definitely, I love playing with people that are really good, especially just because I can compare my game to them. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I got to ask this question. I'm sorry. Everyone probably saw it coming. Playing with Nico LaCastro and specifically when he's putting, does it really take as long as it feels when you're watching it on live coverage, does it really take that long? Okay, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say something first. I I got a bunch of complaints for me taking a long time, and I've actually been a super fast player up until my injury, um, and that kind of set off my r- routine. So everyone, I will be speeding up my routine by a lot. I'm gonna get it back to where it was before I got hurt. Um, I just want to put that out there because no one really knows about it, I guess. Um, cause I'm definitely not a slow player and I know people didn't like me playing slow, but Nico, I mean, I've heard a lot of this and I agree with it as well. The players don't care how long you take. Yeah. Like it's really just the viewers being like, I want them to throw as fast as possible so I can watch more disc golf quicker. Yeah. Like, but like, yeah, I did not care. I mean, it definitely, yeah, it takes as long as it does on live coverage, but I mean, I respect it. You know, he's just trying to line up his shot and make his putt. Um, and I also, like, I got a bunch of complaints for me taking, like, 25 seconds on my 10-foot putt on, like, hole 15 it was. Yeah, I heard that but also. I thought I had that was a, ridiculous. I had a 25-mile-an-hour headwind, and I wasn't just trying to go boink straight in the cage and, like, be like, wow, that's a wasted stroke. Um, yeah. I've done that before. I lost, like, an A-tier and intermediate because I stepped up from five feet, airballed it um, just because I grip-locked the putt, and I used, like, my approach disc, not my, um, uh, not like my actual putter. So now I'm like super like, uh, like I really like to be careful with that. So I know like people really didn't like me taking time on short putts, but as long as I'm within the rules, like they shouldn't be saying anything, honestly. Yeah, no. And I remember watching when you were on Lake Hart on Jomez, um, Jeremy and uh, Paul, they were talking about how they were like joking. They're like, are you sure this kid is like 15? You know, are you sure he's that young? Because he's like, he's taking his time on his putts. He's thinking about his shots. He's not just being dumb and, you know, just like uh, going for everything. He's not running everything. You know, I feel like a lot of younger players do. Uh, So I think that's awesome. I mean, you know, it showed them that you're definitely playing at a much higher level than I guess they expect people your age to play at. So definitely – it shows, it shows in your scores and your performances. Um, but that kind of leads us into what we wanted to talk about next. You know, it was a very windy tournament. Um, it, it, talk us through, I guess we can start with putting and then go to like driving. But putting, I guess, what do you change? You know, what's your mind like when you're going for a putt, headwind, tailwind? Um, I don't know. It kind of just like sucks for like my routine, basically. Because I had developed a routine where I did pump, pump putt and it was like a like a seven second routine and I developed that before wake up I was like I'm gonna do this um and then when the wind's there you like you want to wait for the wind to be as calm as possible so that routine is thrown out the window and you can't do that anymore um but I really just like took Paul Uliberry's tips about putting in headwinds and just put them softer and I definitely like I really stress putting inside only um except for like maybe one time like one out of 10 times you should go putt outside in the wind but I think putting in wind all it does is break your confidence down make yourself have a bad stroke because you're constantly doing the same motion that you wouldn't do if there was no wind 
So you might, that's why people be like, oh, I'm missing left, I'm missing left, I'm missing left. That could be because you played in wind too much. Um, as long as you know how to putt in wind, which I feel like I do. I mean, I'm from Iowa. That wind in Can or uh, Texas was like, it wasn't as close to Iowa wind. Like Iowa wind's even worse than that. And it was like, everyone was complaining how windy it was in Texas. And I'm like, oh, this is nothing. Um, like the days leading up to leaving for Texas, we had like 35 mile an hour winds. And um, I always stress giving yourself a tailwind putt um, and knowing that your disc is going to move left or right more than you think. So you just got to kind of hang it out further. Um, but yeah, with putting, that's definitely how I played it. Just really focused and it did take longer. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on like how exactly should someone putt in the wind? Like I know here in Kansas, like we're not probably as bad as y'all with the 30 mile per hour winds, but I'd say more times than not, you're going to see 20, if not double digit mile per hour winds. Um, and so, you know, facing a headwind, facing a tailwind, like what do you do differently when you're trying to putt when you have that wind condition? Uh, depends on the distance and the wind. Um, if I'm, I'm just going to use, let's just say it's 20 to like 15 mile an hour winds or 15 to 20. So pretty dang windy still. Um, I definitely weigh enough to affect your shot. Um, for tailwinds, anything inside the circle, I'm putting completely normal. Um, my putt gets, has no effect on tailwinds uh, or the tailwind has no effect on my putt. Um, anything outside the circle, I'll actually put it nose up and high. That way, the wind's coming behind me, it's going to push the flight plate straight down. And that way I'm not going to end up way past the basket. And then with a headwind putt coming back, uh, left to right putts. Um, I just put hyzer on my putt and aim at the pole. Cause usually I kind of have tried to like fade it in a little bit, but I just aim at the pole with a hyzer and it usually stays on the pole the entire time. Uh, right to left putts. I know people hate those a lot. I actually don't mind them. All you got to do is aim at the, the lower right lip of the cage. Uh, if you aim at that, it'll lift your disc up right into the chains pretty much every time. And then with a the headwind putt, I'm just putting my disc nose up and doing a slightly different putting style, really spinning from like my left ribs, um, right nose up at the basket, trying not to take my putt off its plane because my, like my normal putt, I don't know, like a lot of people, they like come down to their, like their left knee pretty much. And then they come up and then a putt from about their stomach area or a little higher but your disc is doing a lot of traveling that way. So it's really important to keep your disc on the same level, the same angle the entire time. That way the wind actually has no effect on it. I've had like a lot of people tell me and Paul McBeth's super good at this, that it looks like you're not even playing in wind because if you can play your angles correctly, the wind has actually almost no effect on your disc. Yeah, that's, that's really good. You could, you definitely have a very, I guess, effortless style or uh, putting style. It's very – it makes me so mad. But Calvin Heimberg, his putting is just insane. Him and Eagle McMahon, which I guess all of you guys have, you know, pretty long arms, that kind of style. So you have a good, you know, uh, leverage there. But Calvin, he's just, like, so relaxed. He can be from, you know, circle two, and it looks effortless. And I think it's a lot of that we are talking about, keeping it very simple, keeping it on the same plane. But – it's working for him. He's definitely, you know, one of the best putters in the world for sure. So if that's, I mean, working for you, that's great. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit, I guess, now about driving, you know. Let's say, just for a scenario, let's say you have, you know, a shot that's just going to be tee pad baskets, let's say 350 feet out, and it's to the left, you know, just, uh, just a stock hyzer shot for a, a right-handed player. Um, and you have a 15 to 20 mile per hour headwind um are you what are you going to do as opposed to no wind i guess you need well depending on your disc selection you always want to throw over stable you don't want to have to mess with a hyzer flip so i'll even force stuff over just because i know it's so overstable that no it's never going left but it also won't fade left that much i definitely throw it harder i throw more over stable and i throw it further right because once that disc is starting faded, it'll actually push it pretty far left. And when you're like going through your disc selection, I know you talked about it a little bit, like being over stables. Is that really about it? So like you're not really looking to throw anything under stable into a headwind? 
Or um, neutral, I guess. It, it all depends on the whole shape. Yeah. Um, if I have a wide open shot, I'm always going super beefy, like real overstable. Um, but I don't mind throwing anything into a headwind. I've really developed my angles. People compliment me a lot, my angle control. Um, and knowing how to play in wind with your angle control really like kind of led me to shoot as good as I did compared to like other people. It was just like weird. Like a lot of these top pros I was seeing, like just throwing terrible shots in these, in these wind, like they're almost like not knowing how to throw. And I was just like confused, honestly, but I know they don't usually see this wind that much on tour because some, a lot of the places aren't like in the Midwest, I guess, like yeah. Iowa, Kansas, Texas range. Um, so that, that was just kind of weird to see, honestly. Um, obviously not saying I'm better in any way because I'm not, but I'm going to get there hopefully. Let's look, talk, you talked about angle control. Tell us about how you develop that or like what you mean by, you know, you, you've, uh, you're really good at that now. Um, really uh, lots of field work. Um, but I actually don't do much like actual field work. I go to a course and throw my entire bag on a hole at a time. So that's my field work. And it actually gives you more of a scenario. So you're not just like ripping a shot. You actually have to throw the right angle. Yeah. Um, so I'll go to my course. Uh, I actually helped design a course that was it's about a quarter mile from my house, just down the street. Um, and it's like average, like 350 foot holes, which is about my max distance putter range. Um, I'll just go out there, take uh, like 27 putters, throw nine flat, nine highs or nine and highs on every single hole. Um, and I'm, I'll kind of mix it up. I'll throw it to like where, cause if I have something really overstable and I throw it on a hyzer, like it's going to obviously go left more. If I have something understable and I have to throw it on a hyzer, I'm going to throw it with even more highs. That way it kind of flips up and flies and then finishes left. So kind of whatever it takes to get it to the basket. So, um, that, and my form, I, I just keep going back to my form. Really. Um, the angle I'm going to throw the shot on is the angle I reach back on. So if I'm throwing a slight hyzer, if you look at my reach back, my disc is like right here. And if I'm throwing a, you know, flat shot, I'm reaching back flat. So kind of that, that way you're not like having your wrist completely turned and then throwing a hyzer. Your disc is having to like move that way. So would you say that I guess a lot of the angle control comes from the reach back and how you're like holding the disc, if that makes sense? Um. Yeah, I think angle control comes from that. And I think like hitting your lines uh, comes from wh how you reach back and how you pull the disc through. Okay. Are there any maybe drills or any t quick tips you would have on how to like work on that and make that better? Or is it just one of those things where you kind of have to just mentally notice, hey, I held this on a little bit more hyzer. Here's what my disc did this time. Here's what I did this time. And just kind of build those data points in your mind. Mm -hmm. Uh. I like my pro pole a lot. I don't use it a ton, but uh, I think it's really good practice for that. Um, it kind of keeps your disc. Well, you have to use it correctly because if you use it incorrectly, it can actually mess you up. Um, so yeah, definitely go watch videos if you want to get one of those, but it helps to keep your disc on one line the entire time. Uh, that helps for hitting lines. Then angle control um, is something about exaggerating your follow through pretty much. Um, and just kind of getting a little bit more focus. Like for me, I, I pretty much like have a follow flight in my head kind of uh, before I throw the shot. Like I can see exactly where my disc is going to go before my eye being thrown it. And then, you know, all I got to do is execute it with perfect form. If you can do that, you're going to hit your line almost every single time. Okay. I know personally for myself, you know, I'm trying to work on my form quite a bit. Um, and I'll kind of like go through in my head as I'm doing my, my, uh, my run up and I'll kind of just focus on those points that, you know, I need to, I need to focus on, you know, staying smooth, uh, on my reach back, not reaching too far back. And on my pull through, I definitely like mentally think like, okay, here's where I need to wait for my foot and then pull through straight. Um, do you still do any of that? Uh, or what are you thinking, you know, on your run up? Are you kind of just thinking about your shot? I'm focusing on the line. That's kind of the most important part. I'm not I, – I, a really bad thing that I say I hear a lot of people say is, like, look at where you, you want your disc to land. Well, you can't do that if you don't know 
if you don't throw it in the correct line or angle. So you have, like, I seriously, like, slow-mo in my head. I'm like, okay, I have to go left, but I'm just throwing it in dead straight with something overstable, having it fade a little bit at 20 feet above the ground. Like, I'm a super technical player. I've always been, like, a, I've always studied form. I have, like, tons of people coming to me for form help. Um, I, like, I like to compare myself to Nate Sexton. Like, like kind of like what you said about the announcers saying they were surprised I wasn't going for a ton of stuff. I'm actually like a super safe player. And that's how I got, that's how I won those junior world championships was because yeah. kids do, do make bad decisions. And, you know, I was getting two strokes a hole sometimes if there's OB when I lay up with a mid range and they're going for it with a driver, throw OB and get strokes. So like I've, I've always kept that mentality. I know it's important to get your drives close these days because like for the top pros, the putting isn't what wins you tournaments. It's your circle one in regulation. It's how many looks at birdie you can get because you're going to make your putt like 90% of the time. If you don't have a, if you don't have a look at birdie, that doesn't matter how good your putting is. If you're putting for par, then it doesn't matter. So, right. True. Mm -hmm. Very true. Uh, Horatio, do you have any other questions you want to get out before we get into the ACE round? Yeah. Just one quick one. You know, um, you're, you're 15, you've improved a ton. I mean, you're competing at the level with these guys that have been playing for, you know, some of them over a decade, two decades. Do you think that disc golf, the level of competition is increasing and it's getting harder, um, especially with the, the number of players that are now playing? There's more, there's a higher, higher chance of there being better players because there's more, or do you think that the level of play is increasing? I definitely think the level of play is increasing. I think, I think the players are really like, like I know people can like people. There's an argument of if Ken Climo Macbeth is better, and in my head, it's not even close. Like I just think Macbeth is a million times better than Climo, and yeah, they didn't have as as uh, technology like advanced discs. Like their disc weren't as good back then. If you just look at the form and stuff yeah. and distance, like there's a difference. And it's not really close. I think people are just putting more practice in. Same thing with Calvin. You know, Calvin, four years ago, I know he came to my hometown. And he was he was throwing his drives all over the place. But now we see Calvin known as one of the most consistent players. So it's I think it all comes down to practice. I don't think discs have a big um, factor in that. You know, Macbeth can throw a Luna like 430 feet. I know he did that at Ledgestone. So, like – I don't think I don't think it's the discs. I definitely think it's the players getting a lot better. And as we do get more players, it'll become more like other sports where it'll be harder to be better at the sport. Like basically, like you can be so good at basketball um, at like your school, but yeah. in the big picture, you're absolutely nothing compared yeah. to other people. Where in disc golf, you have a better chance of actually being considered good at it. Um, so I don't. My goal is kind of like I want to like establish. Uh, establish me being a top level pro like within the next five years that's my goal because i know there's going to be a lot of people behind me yeah yeah that's mm -hmm. true there's always going to be a bigger fish as qui-gon Jin once said in an episode of star wars there's always going to be a bigger fish and there's always going to be a better disc golfer it's always going to continue to improve um so yeah i really i really liked what you had to say right there Let's get into the ace round, guys. So this is the same five questions that we like to ask all of our guests and see how their answers kind of differ. So Horatio, why don't you step up to the box first and get us going with number one? All right. You're taking a buddy to buy their first set of discs. You know, they've played maybe once. You took them out. They played once and they fell in love with it and they want to use your get their own disc so they can go out and play by themselves. What putter, mid and driver would you reckon them, recommend them get? I'd recommend them – I wouldn't recommend a driver. Um, that just teaches bad habits, in my opinion. I would just go all mid-ranges and putters. Uh, for Prodigy, i definitely recommend a PA3. That's going to be your dead straight to slightly overstable putter or even a PA, PA4, which I love throwing, which is my dead straight to slightly understable putter. Um, mid-ranges for Prodigy, uh, pretty much any of them. Our mid-range line is pretty, like, similar. Every disc is. Um, Feel-wise – the M2 is my favorite. For me, it's dead straight with a slight fade at the end. It's really consistent. Um, but any any company, just a straight mid-range, straight putter, that's all you need until you actually develop your proper form. Um, then, then you can get drivers. But 
Um, you don't want to be like throwing sidearms and hacking them straight over your head, knowing it's an overstable disc and having it fade out. You're never going to learn anything that way. True. Our second question we have for you here is what is the favorite course you have played and one course you would love to play? Uh, my favorite course I've ever played is in Tupelo, Mississippi. Um, the weapons of grass destruction. It was, is an H that was played there. I played there um, at the end of last year in October. Um, it's the probably the most beautiful course I've ever seen. Just pretty lakes, great views, nice trees. Um, the course itself need like the maintenance is really good, but the tee pads and baskets are garbage. So I honestly think if they got that up there, that would be a DGPT event so easily. It's like a par 69 over 10,000 feet and half the holes are in the woods. Um, it is a hidden gem, just a beast of a course. Um, and then I actually have uh, just, I don't know, I've liked pretty much, I've liked uh, the two DGPT courses I've played, Waco and Jonesboro. Those are nice too, but in terms of like views, definitely uh, it's called Trace Gold in Mississippi. Cool. All right, next question. Your number one tip that you would give to, you know, yourself going back, you just started playing, um, or I guess taking it seriously enough, uh, what was the number one tip you would give yourself? Do not get discouraged because this game just takes time. You're not going to be consistent or amazing right out the bat. Um, you can definitely learn fast, but that, that muscle memory is going to take a long time to develop. Um, I would just really focus on form. And the biggest thing I tell people, and it's kind of like some people take it as like an offense, which I don't see why, but if you have it, if you're not happy with the results, you have to change your game. If you don't change anything, you're not going to get any better. I struggled with that. Like, like my mental health was not good over the off season because I was so mad at myself that I wasn't where I was at in before I got hurt. Um, I think I'm actually a better player now than I was when I got hurt in terms of scores but my distance has declined a little bit, especially with my sidearm. And um, you just can't look at the past. You just got to go from where you're at and keep going up because it's, it's going to be a slow ride. But, you know, you got to climb the ladder slowly. You can't just take these massive pops because you'll never reach the next rung if you do that. Yeah, I really like that. And I'm pretty sure the definition of like insanity or something like that is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So if you're not happy with your result, you have to change something up. That was a really good mm -hmm. tip. Our fourth question we have for you here is what is your favorite memory playing disc golf so far? Oh, I, I got, uh, I think I got two. Um, I, when I was in 2015, at the end of the year, um, I, like, begged my mom to go see Will Schuster at USDGC. Um, and she took me, which that's honestly insane. It was kind of funny because we went for day three and day four, and then day four ended up, like, raining the entire day. The distance showcase didn't happen, so it was kind of, like, a waste of money, I want to say. But um, now that it's over, like, I'm really happy we did go. Um, so just meeting Will Schuster, you know, I was just a little kid, and um, he's, like – my that was like my dream to meet him and now we're good friends um and then my second favorite memory or these are pretty close honestly it also involves will um in 2017 and or junior worlds um they had like a little event going on which uh, with like a bunch of the pros that were there um they were teaching backhand sidearm and then they did like a round that we got to watch but at the end of the day will came up to me and he he um said he gave me a team stamp disc and it was like, I'd like to add you to the team. And then I've been with them so, and ever since. So that was like my other favorite memory because I've always dreamed of being on Prodigy. That's awesome. That's, that's really cool. All right. Mm -hmm. Our last question here is what is the number one mistake you see new players make? Um, man, probably just like decision-making like, I don't think you should ever like try to run a basket, you know, like a lot of AMs are like, they just don't focus as much. Like, so I actually don't have any aces, which is kind of weird to say, but yeah. that's because I'm really focusing on landing 30 feet short of the basket. I'm never going to like go for it, you know? Um, and that's, people always say like, Oh yeah, well that's why you're so good though is because you don't, you're not going for aces, um, which that's kind of true, but decision-making I think is, 
the biggest thing. And then, like I said before, not changing anything. Gannon, it was a pleasure to have you on today. Super glad we got to sit down with you for a little bit and just pick your brain about disc golf. Before we get out of here, uh, why don't you remind everyone where they can follow you at on Instagram and uh, shout out any sponsors or thank anyone you want to before we get out of here. Uh, yep, my Instagram is Gannon underscore Burr underscore DG. Uh, Facebook is just Gannon Burr. Um, hopefully I'll have a YouTube channel soon. And uh, I want to thank Prodigy Disc for everything they've done for me. They're amazing. Go check them out. Please go support them. Um, I want to thank Titan Disc Golf, which is one of my hometown sponsors. Uh, they're becoming, I think, the best shop in Iowa now, which is amazing to see them grow. And I think they just launched their website. I'm not sure what it is. I think it's titandiscgolf.com. Um, but please go support them. That mean a lot to me. And also uh, Wander Disc Golf, which is sweet apparel. We got some really great stuff that has came out recently. And that also mean a lot to me if you could support them because uh, they're a hometown crew as well that is growing fast. Cool, man. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. This was a great interview. Um, yeah, can't wait to see your YouTube. You know, you got to take advantage uh, to get those clickbait titles, you know. Winning, yeah. winning this many world championships at 15, et cetera, you know, take advantage of that for sure. Get some good content. I know a lot of kids, you know, especially you being young, um, this next generation of younger players will definitely look up to you like that. You know, how you looked up to Will. Um, you could be that for a lot of new kids, you know, who right now are just starting out. So definitely get that going. We'll wait for it. Thank you for listening to the Chain Clankers podcast. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Chain Clankers and hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to us from so you never miss another episode.